It's a real pleasure to be here to give this lecture on world view, world vision, and workplace. Um, I should begin just by saying what an honor it is to be here at RTS in Orlando, both to give this inaugural Bavinck lecture and to do so as part of the launch of the Institute for uh, Faith, Work, and Culture. I'm a big fan of all of those things, um, of Bavinck, Faith, Work, and Culture, and generally just a big fan of RTS. So to get to be here at the confluence of all of those things is, is a huge delight. So I'm very thankful to be here. Now, as, as I said a second ago, my lecture's title is World View, World Vision, and Workplace. Initially, at least, I think that two of those three terms will be familiar to all of you, I would hope. Um, world View and Workplace. But I am trying to combine those two with a third term that's probably a lot less familiar to you, and that's the term world vision. And I think that combining those two familiar terms with a less familiar term will, I hope, succeed in bringing together the goals of the Bavinck Lecture and of the, the launch of the Institute for Faith, Work, and Culture. And the way that I'm going to try and do that, as has been said, is not by looking at Hermann Bavink, um, but at his nephew, the missiologist Johann Hermann Bavink. So when Scott in, uh, invited me to give this lecture, he just said, give a lecture on Bavink. And he, and he wasn't careful enough in specifying which Bavinks. There are a lot of them. So I did think I could go really obscure, and I could do C.B. Bavink, who none of you have ever read, but who was very interesting. I could go back to Grandfather Jan Bavink, um, but I thought I'll go for Johann Hermann Bavink, the nephew, who has a lot to say that's very relevant to the faith and work movements, particularly in how we think about the relationship of Christian worldview to the workplace. So my apologies if you came here expecting a lecture on Hermann, but uh, Johann Hermann is really well worth reading as well. Now, before I get into J.H. Bavink on faith and work, um, I want to give you a very brief introduction to him. So he was born in the Netherlands in 1895. His father, Bernard Bavink, was a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church of the Dutch sort, not the, the Dutch-American sort. J.H. studied under his uncle, Herman, at the Free University of Amsterdam, and then moved to Germany for his PhD, which he wrote on the religious psychology of a medieval German mystic called Henry Suso. With his doctorate in hand, he went to the mission field to what is now Indonesia, and he served there primarily as a pastor to Western expats or to westernized locals. He did that for a while and then came back to the Netherlands where he worked for a few years as a pastor. And it was in that period that he wrote the book that I'm going to be talking about tonight. It's a book called Personality and Worldview, which he published in 1928. Shortly after he wrote that book, he moved back to Indonesia, but in a very different frame of mind. And um, rather than ministering to expats, he became something far more like a neo-Calvinist Hudson Taylor. He, he really went native. He took on a Javanese name. He started to write theological literature in a local form of Javanese. Um, he really invested himself in theological education amongst local people. And he started something like a Javanese Labri, if you know what Labri is, so a kind of center for people who were exploring Christianity to live in a community that was uh, in many ways very recognizable locally, but there was a very Christian reimagining or reordering of local culture. In that phase of life, he gained the nickname the White Javan, and he even said at one point in that phase of life that he was born with an Eastern soul. So he had this fascinating phase of life, before he moved back to the Netherlands, where he became professor of missiology at the Free University of Amsterdam and also at the Theological School in Kampen. He lived through Nazi occupation in World War II. He traveled widely here in the United States, and he was a really important missiolo missiologist in his own context. So if you went to a missiological conference in you know, the 19... 50s or 60s, J.H. Um, Bavink would be at the forefront of the discussion if not there speaking for himself. So he had a fascinating life uh, for many reasons, but tonight I'm focusing on one particular um, contribution that he made from this book, Personality and Worldview, which he wrote between these two phases uh, in Indonesia. Now, that's setting the scene for who J.H. Bavink was. So I'm zooming in at this stage to set the scene for the book itself so that we can grasp the, the core ideas in it as they relate to faith and work. So the backdrop to the book, Personality and Worldview, 
is that a young generation of Dutch neo-Calvinists growing up in the first couple of decades of the 20th century in the Netherlands had grown up with a lot of talk about the importance of Christian worldview. It was just part of their diet growing up. Um, but they also, and also how important worldview was for how they lived their lives and also how they approached their jobs. But they'd also grown up in those decades under a tendency um, in the, the, one of the leaders of the neo-Calvinist movement, Abraham Kuyper, a tendency that he had to reduce people to their worldviews. You are Roman Catholic? Okay, this is the Catholic worldview, this is you. Um, so the idea is, tell me your worldview and I will tell you who you are. And for these young people who were coming of age at the beginning of the 20th century, um, well, they were very keenly aware of their individuality. So this is a very early stage of the individuality and the individualism that we tend to associate with the 1960s, but this is, these are the early roots of that. So these were modern young people, and they disliked the way that the language of worldview felt like a straitjacket that constrained their individuality, the freedom they felt as individuals to be who and what they wanted to be. And the word that their culture set up as the alternative to the straitjacket of worldview was the word personality. For these young people, society was offering them a choice, personality or worldview. And that's the background to J.H. Bavinck writing a book called Personality and Worldview. The book's goal is to show these young people that rather than setting personality or individuality as something that's incompatible with the idea of worldview, it's actually possible to think about the idea of worldview in a way that makes much more sense of our individuality or our personality. Now, what does that have to do with faith and work? Well, it's important to know that actually the book, before it was a book, was a series of lectures. And they were lectures given by J.H. Bavinck, not to theologians or seminary students, but to engineers or engineering students at the Technical University in Delft. So the book's original setting is actually vocational education um, for an audience of young Christians who were training for their future careers, but who were under a lot of pressure to give up on the idea of Christian worldview and instead to uh, side with personality or individuality as the thing that they needed to flourish in their future careers. So that really matters. The, the book actually begins in an immediate faith and work context with Christian students at a large vocational university who are asking big questions about how their faith relates, if it does at all, to the jobs that they're training for. So the context matters. It sets the scene for us to view this book as a contribution to a much bigger conversation around faith and work centered on questions like, how do these ideas of personality or individuality and worldview matter to your life and work if, for example, you are an engineer? So I'm going to try and bring this into, update this into our faith and work context today for the rest of the lecture. And I want to do that by asking you at the beginning to imagine something. Imagine that you're applying for a job. And the application form asks you um, whether you have taken any personality tests, the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs test. And if so, it asks you to say what your personality type is. And then you're given a question about how that test result has helped you work out how to function better in the workplace. This happens all the time in the, the world of work. At least it does on my side of the Atlantic, and I'm very confident it does here as well. Um, last week, my wife, who's a medical doctor, had to take part in psychogeometry testing at her work. I'd never heard of this before, but apparently you have to identify with either a circle or a square or a rectangle or a squiggle or a triangle, and then, boom, lo and behold, your whole personality type is revealed. Um, so the personality test industry, which is everywhere in our workplaces, is worth about $2 billion. It's a very major thing. I have to out myself as a skeptic of personality tests at the very beginning, though. I think that they're no more scientifically reliable than horoscopes. Uh, but I think that the most significant part of my skepticism towards them, which is shared with many non-Christians, is the idea that the personality types that they reveal are permanent, that they are innate, and that they are unchanging. 
If your Myers-Briggs test shows that you are an INFP, that is what you will be for life. You are, you always will be a mediator, a daydreamer, creative, imaginative, empathetic. You will always live in search of a calling. Or it's like at Hogwarts, that the sorting hat will reveal what you're really like and where you really belong. Does it see that at heart you're really a Slytherin or a Hufflepuff? But of course, in, if you know the story of Harry Potter, Harry comes to a point where he realizes that actually he has some deep Slytherin traits, and yet the sorting hat made him a Gryffindor. And Harry wants to know why the group he was assigned to didn't match the results of his personality test. And Dumbledore, of course, tells him, in effect, that personality isn't permanent and that he should take personality tests with a big pinch of salt because people change. You can start off in Slytherin and you can end up in Gryffindor. Now, the idea that your starting personality is not permanent, that a bad starting point, like Slytherin, can be redeemed, and that even someone who starts off as a Slytherin can nonetheless end up in, in Gryffindor, that way of telling a story is actually very fundamentally shaped by Christianity because Christianity is a religion that speaks in the language of regeneration, of conversion, of sanctification, of renewal. And ultimately, it speaks that language of transformation not simply for individuals, but for the entire cosmos itself in its consummation. Now, if you think about life in those terms, where the gospel is an agent of change, where the gospel causes us to change, the outlook that you hear from the workplace personality test industry will start to look more and more limited in its usefulness. That outlook tells you, here is the revelation of who you are and what you are really like. And this is what you will always be. It will not change. But the thing that you need to change is the environment into which you put yourself. So change that instead. That's what's changeable. The gospel is predicated on the opposite. The gospel is predicated on the necessity and the possibility of change. The gospel's message to every human that it encounters is that you can and you must change, repent, and believe. Now, at this point, maybe you're listening and thinking, well, yeah, but the gospel and the Enneagram are two completely different things. One is a disclosure of a constellation of personality traits. The other is God's message of salvation. But they're not really equivalents. So for that reason, they're, they're not truly incompatible. At this point, I want to take the focus away from the personality test industry and then refocus our attention on J.H. Bavink. And I want to do that to give you a completely different, uh, reformed way to think about the uniqueness of personality in ways that are important for faith and work. So I've already briefly sketched out this very common model that we encounter in our workplaces all the time, that personality is unchangeable. And now I want to show you from J.H. Bavink an alternative way to think about personality, where personality itself is the product of change, and change through the gospel. Christianity is in no way opposed to the search for self-knowledge. Um, that impulse, the impulse that drives the personality test industry, is not inherently evil, the desire to know ourselves. It's actually proper to our humanity that we have both self-consciousness and self-knowledge. And in fact, it's our self-consciousness that pushes us towards self-knowledge. We are not just conscious beings, but we are aware that we are conscious. And that drives us to want to know what we are uh, and to pursue knowledge of ourselves. And that's proper to the human being's inner life. So Christianity can affirm an, a noble impulse in that $2 billion industry and Christianity can do so because it has felt that impulse across the ages. Think all the way back to Augustine's confessions and his desire to know only two things, to know God, to know his own soul, to know God and to know yourself. Or fast forward a thousand years to the beginning of Calvin's Institutes, 
where the two things, again, that Calvin thinks you really need to know are God and yourself. So self-knowledge is not the problem. The key issue in Christianity is that wise self-knowledge should lead you to conclude, as the gospel does, that you can and that you must change. You must become different to what you are when the gospel encounters you. So how does that work for J.H. Bavink? And why would he choose to start talking about personality and change in this faith and work context? So a moment ago, I posed the objection that maybe you have listening to this, that Myers-Briggs and Bavink's beliefs on the gospel are a really odd couple to structure a conversation around. And maybe you think I'm trying to bring two things together that just don't really fit in this conversation. But actually, when we start to get into the details of how J.H. Bavink developed his account of personality as the product of gospel change, we start to see that his views and the reasons that he articulated that are directly related to the kind of 20th century psychology that has given us the personality test industry. So if you take, for example, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, Myers-Briggs is based on the work of Carl Jung, who was a 20th century psychoanalyst. Maybe you've never heard of Carl Jung, but if you've ever taken a Myers-Briggs test, even if you have only ever described yourself as an introvert or an extrovert, you are directly historically indebted to Carl Jung. Jung believed that the human being's inner life is composed of four psychological faculties. Number one, sensation. Our sensory perception is acted upon. Um, number two, intuition. We make all kinds of unconscious connections uh, to interpret things that we sense, or we have hunches about things. Number three, feeling. So your ego forms judgments about the things beyond itself. And number four, thinking which is an active psychological process that's different to intuition and different to feeling. Now, Myers-Briggs isn't identical to Jung, but they do stand in a direct lineage. So if you think back to your Myers-Briggs workplace personality test, the basic shape of Jung's thoughts there should be fairly recognizable to you. Now, in Jung's theory, if you have these four things, these four psychological faculties, your sensation, your intuition, your feeling, your thinking, one of those four faculties always plays the dominant role. Some people are primarily thinkers, others primarily intuit, others are led by feeling, others are led by sensation. And the dominant place given to that one faculty for Jung then determines how the other faculties are configured and how they function and boom, you have your personality test results, you have your trait, uh, you have your personality type. And that's basically your lot in life for Carl Jung in terms of what he calls your personality. Your pursuit of self-knowledge tells you how you are wired, and as a result, it tells you what you have to live with. And for Jung, there are ways to try and live well with your hardwired personality, but the type is hardwired and it is permanent. In our day, that kind of thinking has become inestimably popular and widely accepted because it is the basis of the Myers-Briggs test. Um, so the average person taking a Myers-Briggs test at work probably has never heard of Jung, but Jung has shaped the ways that they think about personality and, uh, and to a level that is just very hard to, uh, to understate. But here's the thing. J.H. Bavinck was a contemporary of Carl Jung also a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, the other great psychoanalyst who also goes on to shape how 20th and 21st century Western people think about personality. J.H. Bavinck read their works um, carefully and he wrote extensively about them. He wrote a number of books on psychology. He gleaned some valuable insights from both that he thought could be put in the service of Christianity. But most fundamentally, um, interaction with Jung and with Freud uh, made Bavinck return to a much older Christian account of the human inner life, which in turn led Bavinck to have a very different account of personality. Now, I don't have time to give you any kind of big overview of that older account um, of the faculties of the soul or the faculties of the inner life. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was common for Christians to talk about the soul or the inner life as having many different faculties, a uh, large number of them. 
uh, some basic, some very complex. But as we move through the centuries from then on towards our present day, that number tends to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Get to a figure like Rene Descartes who um, said that the soul only had two faculties, intellect and will. Even Herman Bavinck at different points in his writing thought that the soul had either two or three faculties. Now, so the number shrinks down, but the idea is that our inner life does have lots of different capacities or faculties that are there that are proper to being human. In J.H. Bavinck's case, um, we find a figure in that long Christian tradition of Christian faculty psychology and J.H. Bavinck argued that the soul has five faculties. And by soul, he means the inner life, the self-conscious, self-knowing being that speaks for itself as an I. So the part of you, or everything within you that gives voice to itself as I, I think, I do, and so on. That is the, the expression of your soul. So the soul has five faculties in J.H. Bavinck's account. And these are, uh, number one, receptivity. So the soul is receptive to things beyond itself. Number two, uh, conservation so this, or, or retention. The soul conserves things that it is receptive to. So your soul is this treasure trove of memories of everything that it has ever been receptive to. It retains things, it remembers things. Uh, number three is connection. So the soul has a faculty of connecting impressions upon it, things that it remembers, and the connection then you know, joins the dots between things that, that have made an impression on you. Uh, number four for J.H. Bavinck is valuation. So the soul appreciates. The soul isn't just completely indifferent to everything that it takes in and that it connects. The soul adjudicates that it thinks that some things are good, some things are bad, some things are true, some things are false. And lastly, number five, the soul desires. So the soul is driven by a powerful hunger for something beyond itself. And that is ultimately for God. Okay? But beyond that, we desire things beyond ourselves. So the soul is a longing thing. And I've given you a bunch of lists there, four from Jung, five from, uh, from Bavinck. I don't expect you to remember them all or to have retained them. Maybe you have a very retentive soul and you've managed to Story all of these here instantly, in which case I'm, I'm impressed with your soul type, personality type. But, but if, we, if we put these lists together, Jung's characteristics of the soul, the faculties, and Bavinck's on the other, you know, Jung and the Myers-Briggs test that comes from it gives you four faculties, your sensation, intuition, feeling, thinking. J.H. Bavinck gives you five faculties, receptivity, conservation, connection, valuation, and desire. Initially, they might not strike you as radically different options. Sensation sounds quite like receptivity. Um, connection sounds like intuition. Um, feeling sounds like valuation. But there is a really important difference between these two options, um, which is that for J.H. Bavinck, the soul's desire for something beyond itself, originally this desire for God, that, but the, the fact that the soul wants and longs, that plays a far more powerful role in how J.H. Bavinck approaches your inner life than desire does for Jung. Where the soul, so he describes, J.H. Bavinck describes the soul as like a king that steps into a kingdom just by existing and by being self-conscious. The soul wants to shape a kingdom around itself. It wants to create, it wants to change things. It wants to move towards something beyond itself. And for J.H. Bavinck, that power of desire to change things within the soul also applies to the soul itself. So if, you're so, if you pursue self-knowledge and discover that you are not as you know you need to be, then you desire to change yourself. You desire to be, to be different than you currently are. And the most important faculty in your inner life for J.H. Bavinck then is inherently driven to change itself when necessary, when it realizes that it needs to become more than it currently is. So J.H. Bavinck sees the soul as far too driven by desire to be inherently unchangeable and permanent and hardwired like that. But alongside this, significantly, even if we line up these two options, J.H. Bavinck's five faculties, Jung's four faculties, and put them side by side, and for the most part, they do look quite similar, perhaps the most major difference alongside desire between the two is that for Jung, your personality is the configuration 
of your psychological faculties. But for Bavinck, your personality is an entirely different thing. So Bavinck, um, he's gladly willing to borrow insights from Jung and from Freud. And he, and he does grant, borrowing from them, that in every person, every individual, the faculties of your inner life are differently configured. Okay, so you are uniquely wired. You're not quite like anyone else in the world. But for Jung, that's just a difference of ordering. You're wired differently to everyone else. Bavinck was very, he was a Christian and very Augustinian as a Christian, which meant that for him, you are uniquely disordered. The faculties of your soul are not quite disordered in the way that anyone else is, but it is disorder because of the fall. So some people have a predominantly receptive soul, and it leads them to be overly passive. For some people, the opposite is true. The function of desire is completely out of control, and it starves the other functions, and these people become control freaks. And of course, you know, for, for Bavinck, there is only one human to whom we can look whose psychological faculties were perfectly ordered, and we do have a human to look to, and that is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his, in his human nature there. But the point for the rest of us in the human race is that whatever your disordered configuration of your inner faculties is, that is not your personality. Uh, that's not what you should settle in as your personality or your personality type. Your personality needs to be something altogether different. And it's not something that you're locked into with no hope of change. So if, if this distinctly disordered configuration of inner faculties is not your personality, well, what is it? And this is where I bring in the third term, the less familiar term as opposed to worldview and workplace. And that is the term um, world vision, which explains where Bavinck is going with this. So what is world vision for him? Now, Bavinck believed in the importance of worldview and worldviews in this world. He thought that cultures and civilizations are shaped by worldviews and that our lives are shaped by them. But he also thought that a proper worldview, a worldview truly deserving of the name, is expansive and capacious and intricate. And he thought that very few individuals had pursued the truth about the world and the truth about God with so much rigor and clarity and virtue to the point that we could say of that one person that he or she truly has a worldview. To be sure, for him sometimes, for J.H. Bavinck, sometimes people like that do emerge and they develop such a compelling and grand account of, um, of life and the world that they then change culture and other people follow in their, in their footsteps. And also for J.H. Bavinck, pagans do this as well. Confucius arises and then in his shadow we have Confucian culture. Um, and within Christianity, Calvin arises, and then we have Calvinism and Calvinist culture afterwards, and so on. So there are worldviews out there, and there are individuals who ascend high enough on that path of seeking the truth that then they do attain a worldview, and those worldviews are extremely important because they shape the cultures that shape us um, in the sense that we just can't really make sense of Western people in general without talking about Christianity. We can't really make sense of people in uh, various East Asian cultures without talking about Confucius. But Bavinck also thought that it was the case that for the rest of us, for most people, the way that we follow in their wake is a lot less grand and a lot less compelling than the original worldview as, as it was developed. We're shaped by those worldviews, but we ordinary people don't really have a worldview per se. Instead, we have a kind of different... Uh, less impressive version of the same thing, which is what he calls a world vision. Now, let me give you an example of the difference for him between a worldview and a world vision. Imagine that there are two people uh, who each have a tool to navigate. One person has a compass and the other person has a map. The person who only has a compass does have a tool that will orient him in the world. It will tell him at any given moment which direction to go in, but he has no grand sense from the compass of what the world really is like. The compass doesn't confront him with the truth in a grand sense, the truth about the world. 
But with it, he has a view uh, of the whole thing. He can locate himself in the big picture in a way that someone who only has a compass simply cannot. Um, The map confronts him with the truth about the world in a way that a compass on its own cannot. Now, in that illustration, the compass is the world vision and the map is the world view. Every person has a compass, has a world vision, but few people have a world view, a map. Um, The world vision, the compass, is a set, for J.H. Bavink, of guiding assumptions, guiding intuitions about life, about the world, how to navigate it, and you receive those intuitions from the community that forms you, from your parents, from your schooling, from your culture, and all of that together makes a formative environment that equips you as you grow when you're young with these intuitions about the world. Uh, And it does that by ordering the faculties of your soul in a particular way. So for J.H. Bavink, some cultures generally do order people's faculties to be primarily passive or collectivist, and others form cultures with people who are very activist and very individualistic. And by doing so, the culture that we grew up in gives us a basic attunement to life and to the world, and you can use that like a compass to live within that culture, always to take the next step forward. And you can do that like the man who only had a compass but has never seen a map. A world vision is a livable philosophy of life in the same way that a compass is a usable tool for navigation. But the limitation of a world vision is that your community gives you your world vision, these untested assumptions, and it teaches you as a child to live on the basis of how that world vision orients you in the world and to live believingly, by faith alone, that these intuitions are correct and that they correspond to the truth about the world. A world vision teaches you to live as though the world vision is as truthful as a a proper world view. Um, And you have to live on the basis of it as though it gives you the truth about the world before you can ever go on to ask whether it really does tell you the truth. A child that grows up in a community's values first needs to live through those values, as though those values and intuitions are true, before later being able to question them and put them to the test. But the reality for humans, Bavink thought, is that most of us are very happy never to put our world visions to the test, because doing so is really uncomfortable and hard. Uh, An illustration that I often use when I'm trying to convey this world vision, world view distinction to my own students is this. So I spent the first 27 years of my life living in Scotland, Um, amongst other Scottish people with intuitions about life and the world that were very deeply Scottish, that were shaped by that culture. I'd traveled to other countries on holiday, I'd been to Florida twice as a child, been to Disney and all that kind of stuff, Um, and I knew people from other countries, but fundamentally all of these things were tiny drops of foreign water in a bucket of very Scottish water. So I was like that for the first 27 years of my life. Then I moved to the Netherlands for three years, where all of a sudden I became a Scottish droplet in a bucket of very Dutch water. And it turns out that Dutch people are really different to Scottish people in many, many ways. Uh, They react to all manner of situations very differently to Scots. We are incredibly indirect. They shoot from the hip and say exactly what they think. They imagine themselves differently in the wider world as a people. Um, They prize a kind of rugged emotional individuality that most Scots don't. Uh, They feel much less duty-bound to help others than Scottish people do. The list goes on and on and on. And when I was suddenly that tiny Scottish droplet in this ocean of Dutchness, it wasn't really livable or or practical. It didn't make any sense. It wasn't viable to live on in a Scottish cultural autopilot setting, living with my Scottish world vision. The autopilot is fine when you're swimming in Scottish waters and you are Scottish, but it's much less useful when all of a sudden you're swimming in very different water. And that experience of turning off the cultural autopilot, questioning my world vision, was exhausting when you you never have an autopilot to rely on, initially at least. But it was really worthwhile because it gave me a much better sense of self-knowledge about myself and where I come from and of my world vision. Now for Bavink, if you want to pursue self-knowledge, and that is a noble pursuit, The first thing that you have to do is become aware of the fact that your starting point is a subjective world vision formed in you by your community that you can live 
by without ever testing out. And you have to become aware of that world vision, whatever form it takes, and become aware that it's not the same as an objective, tested worldview. In the search for self-knowledge, you have to decide to put your world vision to the test. Your world vision tells you a way to interpret life and the world by default, but you then have to start to ask whether the default setting really does correspond to the truth about life and the world. Rather than just assuming that the matrix is real, you have to be like Neo and ask, what is the matrix? Now, so you put your world vision to the test, and that means that some parts of the world vision will be strengthened and will remain, other parts less so, and they will fall away. The way that your culture has configured, or for Bavink has disordered the faculties of your soul, starts to get reordered. And in that process of reordering and of truth-seeking, Bavink says, you start to become a personality. So the way that he locates personality is completely different to Carl Jung and the way that we hear about it in our workplaces. Okay? Personality is not something you're locked into. We should think of it as the, as the goal for the way that our lives can be changed, that we don't have to stay where we begin. So at this point, he's really different to Jung and our personality tests. Rather than assuming that everyone automatically has a personality type and that personality is hardwired, he argues that personality is something that you must strive to become and that it takes shape only through a profound change in your inner life. So in this regard, Bavink and Jung were opposites. But in what sense is Bavink's opposite alternative account of personality distinctively Christian? So here's the thing, if personality if the best way to think of it is that personality is what takes shape as your life is changed, and as your life is reordered, as the disorder in your soul is reordered, it is possible to try and change like that using resources that do not guide the process of change well. Not all personality formation goes well. It really depends on what it's being changed and guided by. So there are some processes of change. Bavink thought that will lead you just to being disordered in a very different way. And you end up with a very chaotic and even personality because personality formation itself is disrupted by sin. But Bavink argues that God has given us a resource that challenges our world visions and it guides the development of the personality well. And that resource for, for Bavink is the gospel itself. The gospel is a worldview unto itself that challenges every person, wherever it finds them, however their culture has disordered them. And it confronts every human that it encounters with a command of believe and repent. It both demands change and it enables change. Now, I'm aware that I'm, I'm trying to introduce and summarize some really big ideas from an entire book, and to do that in one short address, this is very limited. If you'd like to read the book, the English ed edition, Shameless self-promotion here, but it comes out in April with Crossway. It's the first English translation of this book, Personality and Worldview. But I hope I've given you, you know, until you go and read the book later, uh, I hope I've given you at least an initial grasp of what he means by terms like personality, worldview, world vision. But I want to try and draw this all to a close by addressing the task that um, Professor Swain gave me when he invited me here, which was to use Bavink to show that the Reformed tradition um, has resources that we can use to integrate um, faith and uh, the world of work. And I've tried to move in that direction so far in the lecture by taking a standard workplace practice, like do a Myers-Briggs test, do an Enneagram, and we'll work out how to adapt the workplace environment around something that's not going to change your personality, so I've taken that and I've tried to show that Bavink engaged directly with the source of that kind of thinking and gave a very different account of personality that really is an account of the gospel and how the gospel changes us. But so far that's just showing that an alternative exists. And I want to do something very different at the close of this lecture, which is to give you one final comment or observation on the way that Bavink actually applied that alternative to his audience of engineering students as they think about, as they thought about faith and work in their context, and as concerned as they were with their future careers as engineers. So the idea is here that 
your world vision is formed by the community that you grew up in. But it is also, having really believed in individuality, so did Herman as well, for really good theological reasons, but it's not the case that everyone in the community that you come from has an identical world vision, as though you know, everyone from America has a completely identical uh, you know, disorder of their uh, inner faculties, and all Scottish people are disordered in a completely homogenous way as well. That's not the case for J.H. Bavink. So your world vision is formed by your community, but you are always a distinctly disordered individual within that community. People are really complex psychologically. People are far more individual than just being you know, cardboard cutouts who all are initially wired in the same way as everyone else in their towns and villages and countries. For J.H. Bavink, people who spring up from the same cultural soil, whose world visions are formed there, will have some recognizably common traits in the way that their inner lives are disordered by sin and need to be reordered by the gospel. But we also channel those common traits in very complex, individualized ways. And we, um, we use them to settle or to choose our own individual compasses that will guide us in life. And we'll rely on those without uh, pushing ourselves to really seek the truth about uh, God and the world. So we all have these individual compasses that will be different to what the next person sets up as a compass in life, what they make their world vision uh, what, uh, from. So it's not just the case that Americans have an American world vision and so on. Uh, every individual American will have a different one, just like every individual Malawian will have a different um, world vision. But one of the striking insights in Bavink's book, given as it was first to engineering students, is the insight that very often uh, in late modern Western cultures, you know, industrialized cultures, individualized cultures, our careers are very often the things that we eventually lean to to be that compass, to be the world vision. So to draw some examples from the book, it's possible to make a world vision out of a job as an economist, as a geologist, as a poet, as a NASCAR driver. That's an anachronism, but as a racing driver. Okay? That's one of the examples that he uses, but updating it for this audience. Uh, a soldier, or most directly in his book, it's possible to turn being an engineer into a world vision, to make it a reductive compass, this one-dimensional lens that you will use to navigate life, where your job becomes that one-dimensional lens that orients you to everything. Now, and, and then it becomes a kind of a prison for you, and it becomes the thing that stops you from the pursuit of truth, which in this book is ultimately the pursuit of God. So a practical consequence of that emphasis in his book is that he directly challenges his audience to stop turning their careers into world visions and instead uh, build much bigger maps pursue a rich and mature Christian worldview that then their jobs are located within and that gives their jobs meaning as part of a much bigger whole. In essence, it's another way of repackaging, don't make an idol out of your profession. And I think that's a really uh, important insight indeed. With that, I will close. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I have a ministry called The Collaborative. And uh, they both are alum from that program. And the, in Gotham, you've heard it now a couple of times, it's simply a nine-month program uh, that takes um, faith and work and runs it through uh, a program, a cohort-based model that explores through theological education, spiritual formation, uh, and then ultimately a project, a final project, uh, equipping people how to integrate their faith and work. And so some of the theological readings that, that they read were uh, Augustine, Luther, Calvin, Kuiper. I'm sure all the things that you guys had on your nightstand even before Gotham, right? Gotham. Yeah, yes. So they're introduced to these challenging uh, thinkers that, that they had never been introduced to, but, they're, but it's done in community. And as it's done in community, uh, they're growing together through prayer and through meals. And then it ends, it culminates in asking one question about your workplace or your profession. 
And how can you harness all that God has done in this nine months to address that one particular thing? How can you enter in as sent by God to that place, to those people in that field? How do you serve there like that? And that was one of my favorite things to experience at the end of Gotham. It still is to watch uh, these men and women uh, think through their maybe world vision in a sense, have it challenged the way in which they had maybe made their career or a, a vision of the future, their identity, and have it challenged in new ways and then address it in a fresh Christian way. And so that's Gotham. And so if you hear us talk about Gotham, that's what it is in a nutshell. And they both experienced it. And uh, I would invite James, why don't you come on up and sit right here. I'm going to swing this around here. If you can sit right there, that'd be great. I'm going to try to get a view of all of you. And so our hope for this time, after the lecture, is to uh, engage some marketplace leaders uh, thinking about what is this like day to day in the paint, so to speak. Uh, Whenever you're you're going to work, uh, you have families, all types of responsibilities, and yet you want to live distinctively Christian. You want to walk with Jesus in your workplace day in and day out, okay? And so uh, as we explore that together uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, um, I'm, I'm curious first, Crosland and, and Michael, can you just give us a 30-second version of uh, what it is that you do for work? We can start with you, Michael. Sure. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for having us uh, tonight. What an honor uh, and a privilege to be able to listen to your lecture, James. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled. I miss Gotham uh, when I sit in, in settings like this. Uh, simultaneously, I'm super glad that I'm out of it <laughs> and that I am just focused on my work. But um, uh, I also want to thank you, Damien, and, and Lee Swanson, and, and Kay Storp. Thanks for inviting us to be a part of this. I'm yeah. really thrilled and hope that uh, you get to see some of the fruit of some of these conversations and the fruit of what I think the, the Institute for Faith and Work and Culture uh, is intended to provide. So I'm an, an attorney here locally. Uh, I'm a second career attorney, which means that I didn't figure it out my first uh, time through. I ended up in uh, real estate and construction finance uh, until the uh, economic crash in 2007, uh, and then decided it was a good time to go back to law school. Um, Perhaps some of you uh, remember those days and thought it was a good time to go back to school yourself. Um, So I've only been an attorney for about uh, a little over 10 years. Um, I'm very fortunate to be a partner at the firm, uh, but unlike what that conveys in many industries, being a partner at my level doesn't mean I've arrived and made it and, uh, and been on the, kind of the pinnacle of my career for 30 years, uh, it still means that I'm um, developing. And so I'm wrestling with the idea of faith and work and, and how I connect the dots between what I believe and what I do for a living um, on my uh, trajectory and my career, my growth up, uh, and not from some um, you know, place where I've already kind of made it and decided what, what else. Uh, this wasn't as, as fulfilling as I thought it would be, and so what else, what, uh, what is the purpose and meaning for my life? So I'm wrestling with it as I'm engaging with fighting um, that uphill battle of how you get to wherever it is you're supposed to get to in your career. Thank you. Again, I just echo what um, Mike said and just our appreciation to be here. It's very humbling. Um, It's also very encouraging. And thank you, James, gave us a lot to think about. Um, I have my own company and I really sort of wear three primary hats um, every day. Uh, I'm switching hats all day long. First, I'm a literary agent, so I represent authors to publishers. Um, I work in communication, so that's uh, creating content, managing content, and there's a lot of strategy, marketing strategy involved in that. And then finally, I'm a foundation consultant, so just come in and help foundations do whatever they're wanting to do and help them see if they can do it in the best possible way. Yes, great. Well, thank you. Okay, so Cross and I do want to go ahead and start with you. Okay. So I'm curious, as you, as you were listening to the lecture, uh, what were things that were familiar, sort of familiar highlights that you also found personally significant in Gotham? Maybe another way to ask it is, what are some of the things that James shared and you thought, oh yes, that's been meaningful to me ever since I engaged this all the way back in Gotham? Well, it's one of the last things you said, and that is idols. Um, because in Gotham, you're and I'm sure, I haven't read Bob Inc., but um, I'm sure you're challenged to think about not only what are the idols of our industry, but what are my personal idols, how do those things clash, 
Um, sometimes they're good for each other, sometimes they're bad for each other. And, um, and so that, you know, that just reinforces, and, and actually a lot of what you said, James, actually expands on things that we've already been hearing. Uh, the term world vision is new to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, to provide one more label, one more category to help me order the disorder is, is very helpful. <clears throat> That's great. Michael, what about you? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think we, we talked about it a lot in terms of the, the water that you swim in, the languages that you're fluent in, um, where you know, we, we discussed in your individual career and, and um, place in the market, you speak in languages and terminology that is, um, that, that is fluent for you but might be a foreign language to others. And so to me, the idea of world vision kind of speaks to that of, of this is what I'm comfortable with and I can almost be on autopilot because I'm in this industry and I speak these languages kind of fluently. Um, so recognizing the kind of inherent trap in that, that autopilot, um, and the fact that it's really easy to get caught up and this is the way we do things, this is the way we've always done things, this is the way it works, um, and get with the program. And when you're wrestling with, you know, how do I really truly apply my faith what does it mean to be a Christian attorney? How do I do things differently because of my faith? Uh, because it's not qualitatively different. Uh, I'm not more moral or ethic than, um, ethical than a lot of my colleagues, but I do things differently because of my faith. Um, so don't get caught in that autopilot of, of world vision and of the, the fluency of the languages that I'm, that I'm traveling in, um, but, but be cognizant of it. Um, and, and expand my maps so that I can, um, I can really speak truly about who God is mm -hmm. as a father, speak rightly about him as opposed to just going with the program. Mm -hmm. I want a question to you, Michael. I'm curious um, if these are some of the similarities, uh, what is something from the lecture that was fresh um, in terms of either concept or, or term or that you use the phrase expanded the ways that you've been thinking about faith and work? Yeah, thanks for the unscripted question, and, and it's good. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I frankly didn't know anything about Bob Inc., hadn't heard the, the name before, and so I was just, I, I took a lot of notes uh, through James's lecture because I, I did find it challenging in kind of what I was um, kind of fit wrapping up with a second ago is not to get caught in autopilot of that world vision. I, I didn't think of things in terms of world vision, I think like Croslin said. But that's, that's an easy, easy compass to live your life by. And so the, um, certainly recognizing your vocation, a sense of identity in that as an mm -hmm. idol is, um, I think is, is a good realization when you come to that at first. Um, and having gone through that experience and, and the disenchantment that's caused by that um, and the, um, the difficulty in like kind of recovering your identity um, I think is, is good to deal with, but, but just the reminder um, that we ought not to get lost in that, um, that world vision, that culture that we're comfortable with. Um, and so expanding it, I think is yeah. what you asked, um, is, is just being open. I think being open to what God is saying in a moment, being open to um, constantly learning and, and, um, and talking with others and, and not thinking that you've figured it out, because yes. none of us really have. That's very helpful, thank you. Uh, Crosland, you mentioned this uh, a bit ago, uh, talking about uh, uh, the reading, Augustine, we read in there to talk about, uh, to introduce the idea of disordered desires, which was a part of, of the lecture. And one of the things that you mentioned was there are sort of two realizations. One is that we make work an idol, or we have many idols, work is one of those. Uh, we make it a, an ultimate thing in our life, and we begin sacrificing it to, to it in ways that we might not even recognize, and it begins to malform us and so on. But also that there are unique, we could say, idols in certain industries, that industries themselves require certain sacrifice. Uh, they give us a certain vision of the good life, and they, uh, they invite us, they beckon us to, to conform to that. And so with that, I'm curious, uh, for you, in your particular industry, what, what did you identify as, as the, the idols? Well, for my project in Gotham, I just focused in on sort of the philanthropic world. And one of the things you see in the philanthropic world is 
yes, you want there to be this desire to give, but so often there is either the pressure externally or the ego internally that says, I want my name out there in light because it is gonna make me better, bigger, more liked, all those kinds of things. And so just this idea of if we're in the world of philanthropy, we need to be always challenging ourselves. What's driving the decisions that are being made? I'm fine for names to be on buildings, I'm not saying that, but you, I think it's always a good thing to be questioning what is the purpose? And particularly when you think about celebrities and athletes and those kinds of things. And I know certain situations where NASCAR drivers, they give because they want, you know, they need the name recognition to be a good guy. Now, not all of them, but, you know, there is that pressure. And what a celebrity experiences, everybody else experiences as well. It's just not seen as much. So that was the big challenge. Yeah, thank you. Uh, James, thank you for the lecture. And uh, I want to, um, you are you're part of this conversation in various ways uh, on a global level. You have friends and colleagues all over the world. Mm. And this is a conversation that is, of course, happening in, its, in various ways all over the world. Mm. Um, and I'm curious, as you have experienced it in various places, uh, what are some of the the, the most important things that you find yourself thinking about as it relates to this conversation? So, J.H. Bavinck was really a popularizer of very basic Augustinian insights. And that came up in the lecture. It's great to hear that you guys have been reading Augustine and applying that to work. And you've mentioned a few Augustinian traits. So, um, the idea that, it, so if you reduce your career to a world vision rather than it in a bigger worldview. Um, it's really a, a way to popularize and to apply a really well-known insight from Augustine, which is the difference between use and enjoyment. So for Augustine, if you, um, if you try and find enjoyment in things, gifts rather than in the giver, the gift will always disappoint you. And, then, and that's tragic because the gift is a good gift, but you crush it and malform it. But, so you have to use gifts to look beyond the gift always, to enjoy the giver. And that's Augustine's formula for how to avoid idolatry and to avoid how idolatry will contort your humanity and crush everything that should be good about being an image bearer of God. And, um, and that's such an important insight for the whole of humanity, for how we approach the gospel, for all of life and also for our work. Um, but the, the kind of insight that I find really liberating from reading Augustine, but then also seeing this applied to faith and work through J.H. Bavinck is that work is such a good thing. And um, we saw this in the video, God put us on this earth to work to his glory and work of all different kinds should be, have a basic dignity and a joy because we receive it from God and we use it to enjoy him. But when we turn it into a world vision or when you make your work your idol, that's the tragedy of work as an idol, that it becomes what it should never be. And, um, and I see that all the time in the kind of professional world that I move in globally, which is, yes, it sounds preposterous to call this, but you know, elite academics and you know, global high-level universities where uh, you know, just to, get, uh, to land in a long-term career there, uh, so my secular colleagues would always say that you know, it takes an outrageous amount of good fortune to be the right person who fitted the right post at the right time. Uh, I think about it more as a Christian in terms of God's providence, but um, it's just really hard. You know, the odds are stacked up against you to try and get in in the first place. And um, so when people do land in a career in that kind of environment, um, and you don't have something much bigger to locate that within, the Christian faith, but then also articulated well in terms of worldview. You're, and I, I see academics like this all the time, where you're in this very strange uh, kind of position where at one level you, you're, you, you tell yourself the story that you're very special, you're this elite academic, but at the same time you're incredibly disposable because if you left your job tomorrow, there would be a hundred people, a thousand people who would apply to get it and they would kill to get that job. And um, you, know, you, you have to work so hard, you're expected to work on this incredibly high level for every single thing that you do. Um, but again, if it's all, um, 
if you don't get the use and enjoyment way to flee idolatry as a human being, then you, know, you see these elite academics who get to midlife and they're so cynical. They hate their jobs and they feel stuck within it. And, but they work in things that really change the world and that externally look so inspiring. And you see the human being behind it who's uh, just left in it with a lot of cynicism. And um, so that, I, I, I see that as how you avoid cynicism in the workplace. It's a thing that a lot of academics that I mix among discuss. Um, but the gospel has such distinct resources for that. They're really unique. Um, but if you don't have that, then something that's so beautiful uh, can really look very ugly every day. So I, I always find it fascinating to have a perspective on that as an insider in that world, because it's very different to how people, you know, academic job seekers look on it as this kind of promised land that everyone on the inside is really happy and they love their jobs and, um, and I would do anything to get on the inside. But the inside's really empty as well for a lot of people. It reminds me of a reflection that an author, Stephen Garber, talks about, which is when you, when you engage your work, uh, can you, once you arrive at that place where you both recognize internally uh, how you've been trying to squeeze this in a way that it wasn't meant to, to be, uh, and yet you also realize that the whole system, whether it's uh, elite academia or law or philanthropy or, or publishing, whatever it is, you, we have this, this view of what it is, and you get in there. Uh, can we as Christians know that place that God sent us to serve and still love it? Can we know it and still love it? And by that, he doesn't mean can we still find passion to do it, but rather, if God's called you here, can you be committed uh, to working distinctively Christian uh, in, amongst those people and, and for those purposes? Now, uh, we have just a few minutes left, and, and I, I want to end with a question for both of you. So this room is predominantly filled with pastors, uh, people training to be pastors or other Christian ministry leaders um, uh, represented uh, from all over the place. Um, what would you say, this twofold question, there's no pressure at all, okay? Twofold question. Um, what would you say has been really helpful from pastors in this journey for you in the marketplace, integrating your faith and work? What's been really helpful from your pastors? And uh, what could be more helpful? As my pastor sit here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> well, so I think what's been really helpful, um, I mentioned earlier that I, th I think I, I came into the career of law thinking that my Christian ethic and morality would set me apart. It did in finance, I hate to say, but it did. Uh, my Christian ethic set me apart from my call, uh, from the, those that I was competing against. In law, it, it, especially in complex commercial litigation and transactional work, it doesn't. Um, there are a lot of people that have no faith that do things really at a high level of excellence and morality and ethic. Um, and so what makes me different about the way I practice? And so one of the things that I think was really helpful, particularly um, through my pastors and the leadership that I've um, been able to have the fortune of being up underneath, uh, especially um, on session with, with Dave, Pastor Swanson, and, um, and with Pastor Case, uh, and, and part of Gotham, is to look at 